is bijna kwart voor vijf en dit is Nederland 1 met C majeur. Welkom bij C Majeur. Vanmiddag geef ik graag het woord aan mijn Engelse collega Howard Goodall. Goodall, als klein jongetje zingend op het New College in Oxford, studeert later muziek in hetzelfde Oxford en dan op het Christ Church College. Howard Goodall werd in Engeland een goede bekende door het feit dat hij diverse musicals heeft geschreven, waaronder de Hired Man. En zijn meest recente musical heet The Kissing Dance. Afgelopen januari draaide die musical nog in de Lindbury Studio van het Royal Opera House Covent Garden, naar het Kanishika. Naast musicals schrijft Goodall allerlei tv-tunes en is hij, en dat doet hij al meer dan 20 jaar, verantwoordelijk voor de muziek in de productie van Rowan Atkinson, oftewel Mr. Bean. Vandaag ziet u hem niet als componist en ook niet als tuneschrijver voor uh, Mr. Bean, maar als presentator aan het werk in een ontzettend leuke rondreis. En daar gaat hij op zoek naar de mooiste, oudste, en interessantste orgels van de wereld. Volgende week komt de 19e eeuw te sprake en alles wat daarna kwam, tot en met de elektronische orgels en keyboards van vandaag de dag. Maar in deze aflevering begint Goodall natuurlijk bij het begin. Het oudste nog bestaande orgel in Spanje, Salamanca om precies te zijn, en via de orgels uit de barokperiode komt hij bij de grote Johan Sebastian Bach terecht en de rol die Bach heeft gespeeld in, uh, in uh, muziek. Geschiedenis en met name de orgelmuziekgeschiedenis. En ook de orgels uit de gouden 18e eeuw in Nederland passeren de revue. En de uitzending wordt besloten met een geweldig stuk, de beroemde Toccata van Lidor. Ik heb daar hele goede herinneringen aan. Klonk op mijn uh, huwelijk, we gingen samen de kerk uit en daar klonk dat prachtige Toccata. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Nou, straks hoort u het een betere uitvoering. Heel veel plezier met Howard Goodall en zijn Organ Works. This is United Center, home of the Chicago Blackhawks, who have been welcomed onto the ice by live organ playing since 1929. Frank Pellico, their nimble-fingered organist, accompanies every twist and turn of this refrigerated marathon. Every goal, every penalty, even every puck-chop. Wimbledon's centre court, it most certainly is not. The Circus Maximus, more like. In this first program, we look at how bellows, pipes and keyboards work together and how the full-blown organ evolved. Perhaps the best place to start is to find one of the earliest examples of the species still standing. This is the heart of medieval Salamanca, a spectacular university town in northwest Spain. Behind me, there are two ancient cathedrals built back to back, and inside is a Pandora's box of historic organs.
Tucked away in this cloistered side chapel just next to the old cathedral stands just about the oldest surviving organ in the known universe, up here. Now, no one really knows exactly how old this organ is. They used to think it was built in 1380, but modern scholarship has put it at more like 1480. Either way, it's jolly old. Anyway, it has one distinctive feature that I feel I should share with you. As you can see, it's rather deficient in the pipe department. In fact, it's completely empty. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if that's an organ, then they've got them at Ikea, too, and they're called wardrobes. Well, to establish the difference between an early organ and a wardrobe, we ought to look at some medieval pictures. Whilst there are paintings of a variety of ancient organs, the most common in medieval times were ones you could carry around with you, just the thing for simple and spontaneous music making. The portrayal of them in these pictures is thought to be extremely accurate, apart from the wings, of course. Now, there's a man in Croydon who has dedicated his life to studying these instruments. His hobby is to research the angelic pictures, then build replicas of the organs. His name is Bridges, Jeff Bridges. Jeff. <laughs> Hello. Here you are. Oh, nice, nice to see you again. God, what a beautiful thing. It's one of yours. Yes. yes. Absolutely lovely. Good. Shall I put it on? Yes, that's a good idea. I'll help you. These miniature organs were built with the roving troubadour in mind. One hand pumps in the air from the bottom, the other plays the 20 or so wooden keys. There can't be many people who've got a collection of medieval portative organs in their workshop. There aren't any. So I'm the only person making portative organs. Why have none of these instruments survived? Well, they're very complicated, delicate instruments. You've only got to have a little air leak and it's just no good. Yes. And who were the people that bought these organs? Um, I suppose mainly merchants. That's the, the secular instruments. I think mainly that wealthy merchants had, had them yes. to, for the amusement in the evening and for dancing. And of course, if you traveled in a distance, you went with the cattle and with the cattle, you, the musical instruments and singing and dancing, the frolicking as they called it. Yeah. Uh, went with them. Have you ever done any frolicking with one of your organs in the back garden? <laughs> <laughs> what about the neighbors? What do they think? Well, they just think I'm a crank, I think. <laughs> do they? Well, they know I'm a sort of specialist in organs or something. But beyond that, they, they don't understand it at all. They think these are pretty and that sort of thing. But do they ever come round and have a look at Some of them do, yes. Because some of them are quite good musicians themselves. Mm. But you're, you're an eccentric in this street, do you think? Yes, I'm happy to be balmy. <laughs> Jeff, would you be so kind as to pass me one of your tin pipes? Thank you. Now this, your common or garden organ pipe, is a flue pipe. <whistles> Just like a chimney flue, made from the finest Cornish tin. But you know, there is another type of organ sound altogether. Now this is a crumb horn. It's a sort of primitive wind instrument. And if I take its top off, you'll see that the nasal sound it makes comes from air passing across two little bits of reed. And believe me, reeds to early organ builders were to become rather like toast and marmite at tea time. Savory and irresistible. At first, reeds were put in mini organs of their own called regals, portable instruments which were popular with princes, dukes, and monarchs. 
Their fanfare sounds were perfect for making you seem awesome and royal. And so from Croydon to Kerbog in the Italian Tyrol. This superb medieval castle behind me is the ancestral home of Count Trapp and his family. No relation apparently to that most famous of von Trapps, Julie Andrews. The altitudinous Count, six foot going on seven foot, has a remarkable place here, high on a hill. A few of his favorite things are his magnificent armory, breathtaking views of hills alive with the sound of music, and one of the oldest surviving table organs in the world, an instrument that conveniently illustrates the next stage in the organ's development. Beautiful. Exquisite. Yes, it's been with a very unique, uh, unique program. And it has its own, its own room just for the organ. Yes, yes. Count, this is a very beautiful instrument. Do you know when it was built? Uh, it was built in, uh, 19, uh, in, in, in 1559 yes. from a, a very important man. He was name was uh, Strobel the Oberammergau in Germany. That makes it and one of the oldest working organs in Europe. Oldest working, working organs uh, yes. in Europe, yes. And for whom was this built? He built it for uh, Knight uh, Jakob Trapp, uh, the seventh. Uh, and is that is that him there? Yes, that's, that's him Jakob. Working book, yes, yes. Yes. He's still working here listening book. to the organ, even now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I, I play the organ? Yes, please. Thank All you right. very much. Sit down. <coughs> well, I better get some air into its bellows. It's really beautifully inlaid here, of course. It's 500 years old. It's fantastic condition. The bellows warming up. Um, now, around here, I've got drawer stops, and this is how the air, I select the air to go into the various pipes. I pull one of these out. It's like taking the plug out of the bottom of a pipe. It's going to allow air to get into those pipes. If I pull this out, this should sound a bit like a recorder. And this one here is going to sound a bit more like a piccolo. But what's really significant is this chap here, the one on the end. It's a regal, a reed. And what's so vitally important about this is that when they put together reeds and flues into the same box, that's when the organ as we know it was really born, because you could play them together. <laughs> The earliest organ wasn't just the plaything of princes and aristocrats. From the 10th century onwards, it moved into the church, where the clergy found a new range of holy jobs for it to perform. Like the chaps back here in Salamanca, this is another of their historic organs, the Salinas organ, which is a portative, which means that it was carried around on the back of a cart for religious processions. Quite hard to imagine lugging a thing like this around, what with its bellows and everything, but lug it around they did. And as with at Kurburg, you've got uh, flue pipes at the back and reeds at the front. And if you put them together, this is what they sound like. But it's not just a question of putting flues and reeds together. Even a small organ has hundreds of different pipes. Now, you don't just have one note per pipe. You have lots of different pipes available to you. That's because the different materials they make pipes out of have different sounds. Lead sounds one way, tin another, for example. So I've come to Manders Organ Factory in the east end of London to see how you turn this into these. Just 
perfect man for the job. Ta da! There we are. Oh, well, that wasn't so bad. A soldier's life for me. Oh, it keeps dropping on. Yeah. If it was a bit. Well, that would be easier like that. Is that uh, right? No, not no. really. Down the top. Oh, dear. It's made it worse. Never mind. And that's. Yeah. That's it. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'll find him another cup of tea. <laughs> Now, having made your pipe, you've then got to give it a proper sound, so you come to the voicing shop. Now, this pipe obviously isn't making much of a sound, so if I hit it with this, this languid here, with this pointy stick, um, between the upper and lower lip, I think I should be able to give it a voice. Listen. Voila! This is a rectangular wood pipe. If I play it out, you'll see there's also a stopper in the top, sometimes known as a tampon. And if I take this out, you'll see it alters the pitch quite a lot. That's a wooden pipe, and behind here is a great reed. Now, if you see this copper prong here, you'll see that it's connected. You won't see it, but underneath here, it's connected to a spring um, on the end of a tongue, a brass tongue. And if I move this, it makes the tongue move faster or slower and changes the pitch. So, when you've got your pipe all voiced up, all you need is an organ to stick it in. This particular organ, which is going to a church in Nigeria, will have over 850 pipes in it. But you know, none of these pipes are going to be any good to you at all without wind. And more precisely, wind under pressure. Although the earliest organ builders experimented with hydraulic power, for the last 2,000 years, the organ has usually been blown by bellows. The most primitive bellows simply required brute force. Hence the attraction of a small organ, requiring only one assistant. But the very biggest instruments might require as many as six energetic strapping youths to pump their bellows. So, you've got a selection of pipes and plenty of wind to blow into them. There was only one other thing you needed, and that was a limitless quantity of cash. Even a small, impress the ambassador style one was going to set you back a few bob, never mind a big shock the Pope style instrument. Basically, if you wanted your own organ built for you, you had to be a big shot. You had to be Holy Roman Emperor, for example. In the middle of the 16th century, the Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand I had this Hofkirche, or Chapel Royal, built in the imperial city of Innsbruck. It was intended as a great memorial to his grandfather, Maximilian I. That chap. Ferdinand also had an organ built by a man called Ebert in 1555, and it's one of the organ world's crown jewels. During the Renaissance, the organ developed rapidly from small portable type organs like the Salinas at Salamanca into real crackers like this one. It's beautiful, isn't it? First thing I want you to notice is the small pocket-sized organ leaning over the front, the so-called rook positive, which is imitating the main case behind. What they did was put the more delicate and piquant sounds into there so that it would contrast with the main chorus. This idea of dividing the organ up into compartments was soon to become of huge importance. And there's another innovation taking place down below, because we've got a keyboard for the feet. Here, look, it's laid out just like for the hands, with sharps and flats and everything. These pedals, in fact, don't have their own pipes yet. They borrow from the hands above. But nevertheless, it's quite a step forward. These feet, by the way, belong to Reinhard Yaut, who is the organist here at Innsbruck. 
Pay out. You've got two keyboards now and pedals. What's the difference between these two manuals? The difference is that the upper manual mm -hmm. belongs to the Hauptwerk. This is the main section here. Yes, and the uh, first manual belongs to the Rück Positive. And it's called a Rück Positive because your back is to it, and, and the German word for back is Rück, yeah. isn't it? Yes. We can say that the Rück Positive is a miniature. It's a miniature version of the main chorus. Hey, out. is it possible to play on the pedals the same sort of things that you could play on the manuals? Yes. Let I sh can show you this. I play a little phrase on the manual. The original spot for this organ should have been down there at the side of the nave. But the Emperor was such an organ fan that he insisted it be placed right up here, opposite his own private imperial box. To find out what happened next, we have to head north, across the Alps, where emperors were going out of fashion. In Germany, Holland and Scandinavia, folk were in a rather more independent frame of mind. And it wasn't so much royal pride they wanted to celebrate as civic and regional pride. And what better way to do so than by building yourself a glorious organ? What all these towns' organs had in common was a revolutionary method of construction, a method that was not only efficient, but also cunningly flexible. It was called Werkprinzip. And here in St. Jacob's Church, Ludingwert, on the north coast of Germany, there is a spectacular example of early Werkprinzip design. What they did was to divide the organ up into separate sections, each with its own case, its own wind chest, its own pipes, and even its own manual or keyboard. These divisions were called Werk, and each Werk had its own particular sound quality and job. What's more, like with the Lego set, you could always add a new Werk at a later date when funds allowed. In other words, the modular organ was born. Up there is the Hauptwerk, the main chorus of the organ, sometimes known as the Oberwerk. And down here, a Rook positive. In between the two, above the player's head, in the breast of the instrument, is a cheeky little Brustwerk. And finally, the pedals were given a home of their own. On either side, these tall towers were built to accommodate the new, deeper tone sounds. This organ was built at the end of the 16th century, and it's probably true to say that since that time, not a single organ has been built that doesn't owe something to the Werkprinzip revolution. <laughs> And it's no accident that this development had a dynamic effect on composers. It was like writing for string quartet instead of just solo violin, or like a painter being given a whole new palette of colours. With Werkprinzip, the organ came of age, and the music it made possible has an energy and an intensity that has rarely been matched. In the 17th and 18th centuries, organ builders reflected the bold and lavish splendour of Baroque art. 
The organs they made were an inspiration to the greatest composers of the age. Traveling across Europe, I discovered that many of these distinctive Baroque organs still survive, especially in Spain, where they have lain undisturbed for two and a half centuries. It is sad to see something so beautiful and so old in a state like this. But some of the many thousands of organs that were built at the same time as this in Spain have been restored, and through them we can get some idea of what this instrument sounded like 250 years ago when it was first played. In this part of Spain, sometimes known as the Campos Perdidos, the Lost Fields, you can drive for miles and miles, and all you can see on the horizon, one after another, are huge churches. They're the only thing left, really, that shows the immense wealth that this area had in the 18th century, from two things, from wool and from pilgrims. And when you go inside these churches, it's even more obvious quite how wealthy this area once was. Extravagant and gaudy organs proliferated in every town and pueblo of Imperial Spain. I visited one such town with Kimberly Marshall, internationally acclaimed recitalist and champion of these unique Spanish organs. So you can see the beautiful casework here, the gilded carvings. Beautiful. It couldn't, couldn't be from any other country in the world, can it? No, distinctly Spanish. Now, tell us, you know, what's particularly special about a Spanish organ that you wouldn't find on an organ from anywhere else? What are these things sticking out here, for example? Uh, these are the shamad reeds, um, the clarine, and then moving on across, these very large ones at the top are the trompeta magna. Well, that's, that's really tend to strike awe and fear into your enemies, isn't it? That's Definitely. Um, to the extent that in the 17th century, I believe, there were specific statutes regarding when the organist could use these reeds really? in the service. And made on which days, who? made by the clergy. Oh. These raunchy sounding organs have a robust and fruity repertoire all of their own. Battle music's a big feature of these organs, isn't it? Yes, I think that's my favorite genre in the Spanish style because it's actually telling the story of a battle. So you have scale passages uh, very quickly up and down the keyboard depicting the, the cowards fleeing. And then the fiery reed stops, which give the impression of trumpet fanfares between the ranks. These are the trompeta real, aren't they? The royal trumpets. Yes, and also the trompeta magna that, mm. that we heard earlier. Yeah, big ones. Very big indeed, and meant to inspire awe in those who hear. In the tiny village of Abarca, Kimberly and I joined forces on a piece of this battle music. While the organs of Catholic Spain were spouting fire and thunder, on the other side of Europe, the organ was playing a very different tune.
The hymn that you've just heard so beautifully sung by Christina was written by Martin Luther, and it was in this castle in East Germany, the Wartburg, that he translated the Bible into German, whilst in hiding from some rather angry Roman Catholic bishops. Luther is alleged to have complained that the devil had all the best tunes. So not to be outdone by the devil, he took all the best tunes of the day, especially the popular folk melodies, and converted them into hymns, or chorales as they were known. And he wrote lots of new ones too. Other writers followed suit, and soon the Lutheran hymn book became a sort of melodic greatest hits. Over 200 years, composers working in the Protestant church wrote solo organ music based on these Lutheran chorales. Among their number was one total genius, born coincidentally in the town of Eisenach, just below Luther's mountain hideaway. His name was Johann Sebastian Bach. It would be hard to overstate Bach's influence on the organ. His relationship to the instrument is like Shakespeare's to the English language. He didn't just enlarge its vocabulary, he gave it a distinctive, living voice. His music for the organ is far and away the finest ever written for it, and all the composers who followed him owed a huge debt to his work. The organs that Bach himself played for a living have nearly all been destroyed by time and by two world wars. But on the edge of the modern city of Leipzig, tucked away in a tiny hamlet, you can still find an instrument he knew and played that is virtually untouched. Because of this, the organ in Sturmtal's Lutheran church is indescribably precious. <laughs> Cornelia Schneider, the present organist, plays, the intervening centuries seem to melt away. One thing I do know is that Bach would have appreciated Germany's marvellous modern railway system because as a young man he traipsed around from city to city in order to hear great organists playing on great organs. He was also a passionate admirer of the master organ builders of the day, notably Silberman and Schnittke. Bach's lifetime saw a dramatic expansion in the organ's capabilities. In the big rich cities he occasionally visited, Master builders like Schnitke and Silberman were constructing thrillingly ambitious instruments for the grand cathedrals and churches of northern Europe. And this is one of Arp Schnitke's masterworks at the Jakobikirche in Hamburg. To Bach, this would have been a dream machine. <laughs> Here I am at Mission Control. This is the dashboard, or the console, that controls this whole organ. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why, oh, why are there so many stops? Well, one reason is naked power. There are about 4,000 pipes in this organ. You need somehow to control them all, and these stops do that. The other reason is to do with pitch. If I select an ordinary eight-foot flute, that's eight foot is like on a piano pitch, I can also use an octave higher than that. 
we can actually use these in different combinations as much as we like. And that's just on one manual, on one sound. So you can see that once you start to multiply that by four or five times, it's going to get pretty complicated. Now, there are pipes that don't even play the octave. They play the notes in between. They play like a little chord, and these are called mixtures. Let me demonstrate them. I play an ordinary note. And then I play this chap. You see, he's actually playing a chord. Now, on its own, it sounds a bit bizarre, I accept. But if you add other real sounds underneath it, then it gives a sort of harmonic to the sound. It gives it a sort of snap, crackle, and pop effect. Got some special effects on this organ as well. Thunder. And Christmas bells. called a cymbal stone. So you can imagine if you were a composer and you had a thing like this in front of you, it'd be incredibly thrilling, all the possibilities and combinations you could do. If you were a one-time occasional player like me, it would also be huge fun. Now, there are wonderful Baroque organs in Germany and France and Spain, in Bohemia and Slovenia and Poland. But if you were really into organs in the 18th century, there was one country above all others that you just had to visit. It had enormous wealth from its maritime trade. It had civic projects on an unheard of scale. And it had a regime friendly to artists and craftsmen who were often exiles or refugees from other parts of Europe. They came, of course, to Holland. And this place has always been a mecca for the organ tourist. It's the St. Bavo Kirk in Harlem, and it has inside it what many consider to be the finest organ in the world. Mozart came here and raved about it. So did Liszt, so did Saint-Saëns, and so has practically every other organist and composer who's ever seen or heard it. Jos van der Koy holds the prestigious post of organist here in Harlem. Jos, many famous people have been to visit this organ. Why has it become so famous? It was a famous organ right from the moment it had been completed. Mm. Uh, a big organ, big sound, and a great visual impact. A beautiful church. It makes a very good ensemble for the ear and for the eye. What do we know of Mozart's visit here? They were on one of their big tours through Europe uh, to make the money. And as a treat to the young boy, they took him to see this organ, which at the time was a new organ. It was only 28 years old. Did it make a great impression upon him? There are some pieces all through his life which they think were written with the organ in mind. But when you hear the drum structure of the big F minor fantasy, uh, you can imagine that he thought back to this magnificent organ uh, which he played when he was 10 years old.
the last leg of this journey takes us from 18th century Holland to 19th century France. Bach and Mozart aren't exactly the end of the story, but it was at least a century later before someone came along to galvanize the organ into brilliance once more. This time, it wasn't a composer, it wasn't even a player. It was an engineer and a towering genius to boot. His name was Aristide Cavaillecon. While still a student apprentice in Paris, he invented a forerunner to the harmonium. He patented a circular saw, and he shocked the organ world of France by winning the contract to build this organ. This is the Abbey of Saint-Denis in northern Paris, and it's no ordinary church. A thousand years worth of French royalty lie entombed in this basilica. Imagine a 22-year-old unknown getting the job to build the organ here. It made him famous overnight. He finished it in 1841, and he and his company went on to make 600 others. The brilliance of Cavaillecon's work drew, as if by magnetic force, the great French composers of the day to the organ, like César Franck, for example. Now, this is crucial, because whilst in England, composers were writing great choral music for the organ to accompany, here in France, it was becoming more and more a solo, indeed a dazzling virtuoso instrument. But however grand, romantic, or symphonic the Cavaillecol style became, he never lost sight of the fact that he was part of a long tradition of French classical organ builders. One of his most impressive instruments here at Saint-Sulpice in Paris was based on the work of an earlier builder, the Baroque master Clicquot. Cavaillecol's great achievement was to combine his new technology with the art of the 18th century. Daniel Roth is the inheritor of an extraordinary musical tradition here at Saint-Sulpice. Monsieur Roth, there have only been 12 organists here in 400 years, and you are the 12th. How does this make you feel? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> no, because of all these uh, great musicians and composers who have played here, I try to do my job the best I can do, uh, but it's a terrible responsibility. What are the distinctive sounds that Cavai Cole introduced to this organ? When he started his great instruments, he brought some new stops like the flute harmonic. <laughs> Of course, the for instance, this is also something very beautiful. Of course, the reeds, the reeds are very typical. When I hear this organ, it, it sends shivers down my spine. So how must it be like for you to play it every day? I am now here 10 years. But every day when I come here, I just find new combinations of sounds. <laughs>
Dat durf ik dus ook nee, dat durf ik dus niet. Nee, nee maar ik vind Dagelbert ook leuk. Dat is plat, dat is plat. Ja, het is plat, maar het gaat nu nog. Het gaat nu nog. Je hebt te lang je vrij.